mandating somebody to go uh, uh, to the court for them. What is Article 82? 82 is claiming compensation for something. And what is this other uh, directive that we might talk about? This is about claiming compensation collectively as a group of people. Now, uh, if you realize, I have skipped, I have not mentioned an article, which is Article 78, which is about a data subject going, taking to court a DPA. This is not in our program. However, <laughs> however, it is true that this morning, yes. this morning somebody mentioned that that might also be a good idea occasionally, if necessary, uh, to eventually you will have, uh, somebody has to take uh, this DPA to court. So I don't know. Uh, if we cover everything, perhaps we have time to also cover 78. Uh, I, I don't know. <coughs> I wasn't told. But uh, maybe we can do it. So what are we going to do? That's the, the subject. Uh, we have here four great speakers to talk about this uh, subject and uh, many other uh, interesting subjects about enforcement. I will briefly, briefly introduce them uh, in order of uh, probable appearance. We have uh, Johnny Ryan, uh, your senior counsel with the Irish Council of Civil Liberties, uh, a well-established uh, NGO, dealing with many, many uh, issues about civil liberties and also especially um, data protection. You have been very, very active in the, this uh, subject of uh, data, data protection enforcement and very active is here an understatement, I think. So you have many, many things uh, to talk about. So that will be then probably, um, I will give the floor to uh, Romain Robert. You are a, a senior, uh, no, program director at uh, NOIB. NOIB is, I think, the only NGO that has really, uh, in, his, in its description, uh, it's, it's an NGO concerned with the enforcement of data protection as such. Or it used to happen as, as a foundation, um, uh, as a basic idea. It is about the enforcement and making this data protection uh, real. So that will be NOIB. Uh, Roman, you also have other uh, responsibilities. Uh, you, but that might be here relevant or not, but you are also... Uh, a member of the litigation chamber of the Belgian uh, Data Protection Authority. Then we have Judith Rahofer. Uh, you are an academic, which is uh, very good. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> academics are welcome. <laughs> and uh, you have been uh, working on data protection privacy. You are a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. And you have also been following closely um, discussions about strategic litigation as a legal advisor for uh, digital Freedom found. Good, good. I don't mix uh, terminology with an effort. And finally, uh, we have Paul Olivier de A, and he is uh, actually uh, the founder and CEO of Estia Lab or Estia AI, which is a company, I think officially it's a company, um, and it's about not really litigating as such, but about making use of data subject rights uh, in a collective way. So using uh, data protection, not just from an individual perspective, but with a collective uh, purpose. So it does relate to this Article 80 uh, kind of spirit also. So we will have a, a discussion uh, and the ideas that we discuss all this. If we see if there are any problems uh, currently about these uh, judicial uh, remedies and if there are, what could be the, the solutions, everything in, in, in one hour and you're all ready for this. But I will then first give the floor to Johnny Ryan. If you can tell us more about why is this Article 79 specifically potentially important, why would people actually want to go to um, court and take anybody to, to court? Thank you, Gloria. And it's interesting you think academics are good. And <laughs> you didn't introduce yourself. She's an academic. I, yeah, yeah. I, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> and I'm Gloria gonzalez Fuster. I'm a research professor at, at VUB. Yes, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you moderating this. And she's <laughs> also very happy to be an academic. Yes. <laughs> um, 79. Well, <clears throat> one of you did that. Um, we, we could have counted ourselves very lucky as citizens because with the headwinds of Snowden behind them, our legislators came up with an incredible idea. They would take some institutions that already existed and they would cause the creation of new institutions where there was not already one. And they would empower these institutions to be able to go into any organization, pretty much any organization at all, and open any file or box. In some member states, you'd need a warrant. And in my member state, if one of these institutions, one of these agencies, were to be lied to by a member of staff in, for example, a company that they were visiting on one of these raids, 
that member of staff could be imprisoned. So we had this moment half a decade ago where our legislators gifted us with something called a supervisory authority, granted enormous powers to act on our behalf. And what has happened in the last roughly half decade is that those powers have largely not been used in that manner. It is impossible to get statistics, and I have tried very hard to get statistics on the number of times that supervisory authorities have actually raided, raided any large firms. You cannot get those statistics. In this situation where we, on the one hand, have these empowered supervisory authorities who can act to protect us, but have not yet really done so, maybe in some minor cases, yes, but they have not done so. 79 is all we have. It's our safety net. There is no alternative. We have to go to court. There's nothing else that we can do. Thank you. Um, that's interesting. Uh, and I think uh, potentially people can agree, but I remember we were uh, not a long time ago in another panel where actually there was a lawyer, perhaps we should never trust lawyers, but there was a lawyer saying that actually um, it's not only this, but also it could be great, actually. It, he was very optimistic about the many things that courts can do that perhaps DPAs could not do, even if they wanted to do something they could not uh, do. They're like invalidating laws, like doing things that um, DPAs cannot do. So I suppose in addition to that, there's potentially uh, an optimistic uh, approach to this. I wonder if Roma is in an optimistic uh, uh, view regarding this. Uh, I think Noib, one of the reasons why Noib was established was indeed to, to, to go and use remedies. After four years, are you optimistic a little bit <laughs> about uh, going to court and taking controllers' uh, processes to court? Uh, thank you, uh, Gloria, for the question. And thank you for the wonderful opportunity to um, speak to this uh, conference, which I think is a really bold move from the EDPS to address an issue which I think two years ago was not really something that I think no one wanted to discuss, the lack of enforcement of the GDPR. And here we are. So, um, And that maybe answered the question, of course, <laughs> that no, I wouldn't say that um, even the judicial action, we didn't do that many at NOIP, um, were a huge success. Uh, as you know, we just focus on complaint mechanism and before the GPAs. Um, judicial action is something which is um, possible under GDPR, so uh, under Article 80 of the GDPR, NGOs like NOI, we can also act on behalf of a complaint and not only behalf, uh, before the GPAs, but also, also before the courts. Um, what is also um, remarkable is that the Article 80 slash 2 of the GDPR has never been implemented in any member state. Uh, and I'm quite sure about it, um, even if I just read something um, contrary, but we can just discuss. Um, so the, this article just allows the NGOs to um, file an action before DPA or before court without a proxy or without a representative agreement from a data subject. So that would be something really useful for us because we always talk about collective dimension of GDPR enforcement and this Article 82 would be like a tool for NGOs like us to go to court to represent the collective interest and to have a collective uh, dimensions uh, for the GDPR infringement. Um, but I would say that uh, going to court is also an option which is costly, so that's why we are really careful when you go to court. Um, is it more efficient? Not always. Uh, but when we see that sometimes you have to wait four years for have just an opening of an investigation from a... Oh, it was a reminder that the answer is too long, maybe. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. uh, good remark. <laughs> <laughs> and nice song. Uh, so I would say that judicial remedy is not always easy uh, to action because it just uh, takes a lot of resources, lawyers, not only financial resources, but you have to manage the case. You can't just leave it up with the DPA. You have to manage the case to instruct the lawyers. You have to follow the, the procedure uh, in court. And there was a lot of disadvantages, but I will not discuss all of them uh, when you go to court. The lack of specialty from the judges. When you go to a DPA, you know that you have experts in front of you. A judge, you never know whether the judge will be totally knowledgeable uh, regarding the GDPR. Uh, court can be also very surprising when it comes to a decision regarding the GDPR. You can see that the court outcome 
and the DPA decision are sometimes contradictory. They don't see things from the same angle. Um, but of course, there are advantages if you go to court. For example, you don't have the one-stop shop. And that is really a relief when you go to court. You don't have to deal with all this mechanism of cooperation between the judges. So you don't have to make sure that you complain has been has not been lost in Norway on her way to Estonia, for example, which happens a lot with the complaints. Um, but I would just say that it's not a huge success. Uh, but this year we decided to have two big priorities. The first one we we go first against the DPA and especially the one we are not acting after two years, so we're just trying to challenge the lack of action of DPA, but also we are preparing, and we can maybe discuss it later, I guess, like um, we are prepared for the collective uh, redress directive, uh, whose implementation is going to be end of this year, so we are now preparing ourselves to have a network of lawyers, to have fundings, to have cases, to go directly to court, but not on the basis of Article 80 of the GDPR, but on the basis of the collective redress directive, uh, and that's going to be a I guess it's going to be a test, I think, because this hasn't been tested that much uh, so far. Perhaps to situate, um, because not everybody has to know everything about the GDPR. So Article 80 slash 2 that you were mentioning is the, this possibility for NGOs and, and other institutions to go uh, to lodge complaints and to go to court without the mandates of a specific uh, data subject. I think this is possible um, in some cases, because I remember a strange case where in Spain, the Spanish Data Protection Authority accepted this kind of uh, complaints, but then um, um, another surprisingly Irish uh, DPA rejected the thing. But it, it was possible in Spain to do this. Um, so perhaps we can further discuss this. But this is very much indeed about not having to wait for a data subject to have to come uh, with a specific problem, but uh, just thinking um, as, as NGOs, as associations, what has to be done and, and how can we do this? So this takes me to this question of, is this strategic litigation uh, somehow that we, we decide uh, what uh, has to be done and we don't need uh, this data subject? And I'm looking at you, what are your views uh, about this? You can just also ignore my question and just uh, say what you want to do. No, that, that's actually a really good question and thank you for that. Um, I think there are there are issues with that mindset, um, and, and you said before I was working for uh, the Digital Freedom Fund uh, for the last year, and I think that that is one of the, the main issues that we have observed. So I think my, my approach to this uh, whole idea of power to the people is is on the one hand that we need to see it not just as I think Mark Schrem said it this morning in the plenary that as an as an or. Uh, as an, uh, but as an end, I think we need to we need to look at it as one tool in the toolbox, and we need to make sure that we somehow collaborate and get a bird's eye view of the entire picture. Because we're, when, if we're talking about you know are we going to do this or do are we going to do that? Are we going to bring litigation or go to the DPA? Then we're we're always giving something up. Um, at the same time, I do appreciate that this is a big ask, particularly for under-resourced NGOs. You know to keep a view of the entire um, of the entire picture, and and I think that's the other thing that where we just need to force and forge coalitions um, also with the DPAs uh, in this context to make sure that everybody's doing their bit. But I think what what you said about the mindset of you know. Um, representative actions without a mandate. I, I am in favor of those, but I would, what, I, what I would caution, I think, is uh, this, this idea that we put the law first, that we start from the legal point that we want to clarify, that we want to get a court's view on, and that we then go out in search of a claimant, or that we are thinking that we know best about what, what the legal questions are uh, that we should be addressed here. Um, and I think what we're, what, there are two reasons for why, why I'm cautious about this. One of them is capacity. Um, one of the big problems of actually giving power to the people is that we're currently, the people we're currently looking at is a very exhausted bunch of people who has been around the block for a while, um, who has, you know, by and large fought uh, to get the GDPR on the books in the first place and who is really very tired. And, and to give them just more responsibility of now ensuring enforcement is a very big ask. But the other thing also is, that, so we need to broaden that base. But the other thing also is that we need to appreciate, I suppose, that the people most affected by breaches of debt protection law are very often marginalized communities. Um, and this mindset of finding the right claimant rather than making the connections and creating the trust with those communities that mean that they are coming to us 
you know, that they actually really sort of start trusting uh, digital rights organizations, for instance, and, and DPAs uh, to help them protect their own interests. I think that is, that is something that we still have some work to do on. Um, and therefore, if you're looking at, you know, non-mandate representative action, that, that is something where we can very quickly go into a paternalistic sort of mindset that might actually ultimately cause more disconnection with those affected communities. And that's, I think, the one sort of note of caution that I would sound here. Thank you very much. Um, as a footnote to this, I, I would love to believe that it's the case that people can't really choose between Article 77 and 79. The truth is that we don't really know anymore. Uh, I think reading the GDPR, many of us thought that it says you can decide to lodge a complaint with a DPA or go to the court. But there is now a pending case uh, in Luxembourg from a court saying, mm, we are not really sure that it really it is like this. My experience now reading documents from DPAs, there are some DPAs who say uh, when you try to lodge a complaint, beware if you have uh, you have gone to court or if you are planning to go to court, uh, we will ignore your complaint, which is for me quite um, strange, uh, but I don't know if you have any reactions or do you just agree that it should not be like this? And that's maybe something we need to litigate about. The, the, the very that principle that you have to choose, <laughs> yes, perhaps. Good, but we we'll continue just to, to get everybody in, uh, into the discussion with uh, Paul Olivier, and I think that, that was a very interesting uh, reflection. How do we actually get to understand what are the problems of the people, um, that it's not just us trying to do it, puzzles with the GDPR, that we figure out what are the real problems, what is happening to the data of the people, and I think what you are trying to put in place, it's also about this, yeah. try to identify issues. Yeah, so it's, it's to try to help those issues bubble up through individuals who are actually affected and communities because there's al always, in my thinking, this collective dimension as well. Um, so I'm thinking, for instance, of Uber drivers who have met Uber drivers all over Europe who, when the GDPR happened, tried to get access to their, to their data because they could anticipate that this was relevant to their struggles, their work struggles. I mean, we heard Uber's DPO who asked a question this morning, what can DPOs do? Well, it's pretty obvious. They could answer access requests. We also heard, uh, we, we also, oh, they, or even simpler, maybe just check that the website, the links work, things like this, instead of sending people to links that don't work. Um, and why am I focusing on access? Because it's actually a crucial element to answering some of the questions that you raised, um, at least according to me. Uh, the, this, this element of access, this capacity of accessing data about yourself is crucial in order to constitute around you a whole network of actors who can help you defend your rights. So it's, it's if you have access to your own data, you're, it's the beginning of a step where you can collectivize an understanding of what is being done with your data, the consequences, and the um, the, the capacity of connecting with other NGOs. So maybe it shouldn't be NOIB that is at the forefront of litigating, but it should be NGOs that defend women's rights, for instance, online regarding um, non-consensual uh, sharing of, of images. And um, these types of problems where those NGOs are not necessarily conscious that in the first place, this is a matter of digital rights, this, um, this is a matter of data protection. Um, but if I, if I observe all of this, I see that there's a tremendous amount of inefficacies on the civil society side. I mean, we were worried that maybe this panel, people would be too much in agreement. But actually, I think that civil society is very inefficient in building cases, building effective cases in court. Um, addressing those issues. So even with Uber drivers, they go to court in Amsterdam, eventually they end up there. And then the, the, the argument they make is, we want access to our data, but without a clear perspective on why each individual data point is relevant to their own struggle. So th there isn't a sufficiently comprehensive network of support around the case that they are trying to push. Can I jump in? on a similar idea. It would be great if we had um, people who were affected, who knew they were affected, and then knew what recourse they had. The problem is we actually, I think, need to rely either on 
the kind of research that you do, or on industry whistleblowers, who end up telling us what's being done to us, because very often we don't know. So we may know and be able to uncover some consequences, but actually, until we have someone in the industry say, I can't live with it anymore, here are some documents, this is what we've been doing to everyone, or to this type of group, we're kind of fishing blind. And uh, I think it's important if, if we're looking for plaintiffs and cases and, and things like that, there's two things that I have in my mind. One is, <clears throat> very little has yet been done. Right? So Noib is out there doing lots of great work there's a few organizations doing really good work, but this is very small compared to what has been allowed to grow over the last two decades. And there are really apparent infringements around us every day. Every enforcer wakes up in the morning, switches on their device, and is confronted by some consent spam, for example. <laughs> that, that kind of thing. So there's a whole lot of low-hanging fruit. We, we don't have to make things complicated. There's you know, obvious things that are today quite simple. We might end up getting into quite complicated things if we succeed here, um, maybe next decade. But we just need to get the basics right. And the second thing is, to get the basics right, we need insight from inside those organizations. And that is why this is such an unfair fight. The DPAs aren't going in there and using their powers to get the information. Maybe they don't know how. We're not very often able to do that ourselves. So we are, I think, incredibly reliant on the consciences of people inside the organizations to help us. I think, uh, at Noib, you have a sort of possibility for people to raise the alarm. Uh, yes, I was going to mention that we, we developed, like a few years ago, a secure drops mechanism, so which is like a, an anonymous way for any person, especially working within an organization, to uh, to whistleblow. It's just like in line with the whistleblowing directive, anonymously, any violation of the GDPR or any other digital rights uh, that has been observed by this person, it can just uh, send this uh, information and piece of information anonymously on our website. So I just advertise it as well. If you go to noib.eu, you will see we have like a secure drops um, tab somewhere in the menu and somewhere over there. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a great tool, of course, for people to share with us any violation or alleged violation that they would love to share with us. Uh, that's the first thing. And I just want to also jump on the, um, the, the I understand the collective redress as well. Uh, so, uh, the, not the collective redress, sorry, the collective dimension uh, to address specific categories of people affected by a specific violation. Uh, we also have, and it's just really specific to NOIB, maybe but a ticketing system, like a, like a help desk when people can write to NOIB. They can be member or non-members. And so we kind of collect and, and like test the water and, and see do we have a recurrent violation? Do we see a, a specific group of people affected by a specific violation? Do we see n not specific people, but like a lot of people affected by a specific violation? So that's how we, and we do as much as we can, because it's, of course we're a small organization, to, 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 to feel the, how do you call, I would say like the smell of the day, like <laughs> uh, just to, to try to have an, an idea of how, what are the main issues and uh, the, the violation that people are facing on a daily basis. And so we're trying to have not a strategy, but we're trying to address these cases when you see that, for example, in the last six months, we have so many violations by the same company on the same subject that it might be interesting to make a, an action against the company. I have a sort of existential question um, that is not prepared here, uh, but I, I was really uh, thinking about this um, the other day. So I think one of the interesting things about doing this kind of litigation for data protection is precisely not to do it for data protection, but because people have real problems which are related to the data. And Uber drivers are an example, but there are so many cases where we know there are issues, uh, very important issues for people that we can only solve if we get um, access to the data, if these issues are solved. But there are some people uh, that exist on this planet who think that it's illegal 
to use data protection for a real purpose. And there was, again, a, a case that I, I did not see because it was a German case, um, and we never see those cases, but somebody saying again, and it has been said in Spain uh, a few years ago, like if you have a real problem with your employer, for instance, you should not use data protection law, and the court will reject this. And there was recently in Germany saying it's an abuse of rights, and it's not just a theoretical concern, it's really some judges believing that it's an abuse of your data protection rights if you have a problem with your employer or with your insurance company or with somebody that you will go and try to use um, data protection law. I see that you are not um, in agreement with this argument, but have you ever encountered this argument as a real thing, say, people saying, no, you should not uh, do this um, because that's not the purpose of data protection law. That's an obstacle that you have not encountered, so that's, that's cool. It is something that I think is, is regularly raised or was raised in, in the UK for a while because um, a lot of lawyers, me included, have used subject access requests as an alternative to disclosure and employment disputes. So. Um, it wasn't a popular. Um, it wasn't popular, I think. But I think it, you know, it is something that I feel it is now a shadow argument or a shadow fight because there is just nothing in the GDPR that will support this in any way. You know, to, to, that, that is an abuse of rights. But if I may on this, um, um, it's interesting because usually DPAs are just following this line of argument. They're usually DPAs are just always ordering the controller to disclose the information. There was no exception that the DPA would just discover by accident. But we have recent court cases uh, that we observe, in, especially in Germany, by judges. And that shows that some, sometimes going to court is not always like a huge thing, because you might have like a really bad decision. Just apparently just refusing the access request made by a data subject on the ground that the data subject was not looking to have transparency but it was just it was uh, with the insurance company. It was just trying to get access to his uh, information to know why the, the prime was raising, so what he had to pay more than the month before. So he wanted to have the the reasoning behind the calculation of the amount that he had to pay every month. And on this basis, the court in Germany refused the right to access for this data subject. So that was quite surprising. I think you will not have such a decision in, with the DPA. And that also shows that going to court might just give you some weird decisions sometimes. Any reactions? No, you are also entitled to ask each other questions um, because we are we're doing very fine. I just, I just want to add on what Johnny was saying about whistleblowers. So in a study we did um, in Finland with uh, 15 VIPs, let's call them, maybe 10 um, politically influential people, including the ex-Prime uh, Minister of Finland, uh, we got them to collectively, or to like each individually, but as a group, I don't know how to say it, ask for their data to try to illustrate a little bit um, of the data economy, and in particular, particularly the influence economy, how they might be influenced through data, how they might be targeted with information. Um, and one of the things they asked is they asked directly to Facebook with an email um, data points that were included in previous leaks, including Haugen's leaks, um, the Francis Haugen. So data points that we know from the leaks Facebook has about each of us, <coughs> um, things like world to vec so how Facebook classifies us, our relationships, the places we go. Um, of course, we didn't get any response from Facebook. Uh, one of the participants filed a complaint with the Finnish uh, the protection ombudswoman who is here, and that came into the one-stop shop mechanism. But this is, uh, and so it's basically gone for at least a year. But I think this is the example of, of efforts that can be done to really inform further actions by different actors in civil society, including researchers, but also journalists who can encourage more people to exercise their rights in this way. And of course, also NGOs who might go to court. Um, all this is important because it can, it can fight against the dynamic that Max Schrems described this morning, where when people exercise their rights, they don't get anything, then they are discouraged from exercising this right, their rights. It's a, it's a negative feedback loop that needs to absolutely be countered and become a positive feedback loop. The more they ask, the more they get, the more relevant it is to them. Um, and that could drastically change the entirety of the data economy. I mean, we heard it several times today. Um, a lot of people are trying to do things right now 
blind. They have no idea how data flows. They have no idea what are the consequences are. And it's really impacting <coughs> our collective ability to change things. But what they do have an idea about is how it affects them. And I think that's where I would like to, to sort of respond to Johnny on this one, because I, I, I agree that having whistleblowers on the inside is really important to find out how the sausage was made. Mm. But the fact that the, the sausage is being fried in front of your eyes is something that the affected people absolutely do know. And, and you know, it's, it's not obviously just in the private sector, it's in the public sector as well. You know, the uh, benefits claimants whose data is used to essentially deprive them of benefits that they're entitled to, they know that something's happening with their data that is actively causing them harm. They just don't necessarily know how to counter it. And I think the problem that we have civil society, from a civil society perspective, often have is that I don't think we've managed to create the trust to then ensure that they come to us. And I think that's the thing that we really need to look at. Because, and, and it's really easy because, I mean, I look around at this room and, you know, Who's in the room where it happens? You know, and, and I think this is, how do we change that? That is a really, really big question, I think, for me in this context. It, it would have been a newspaper, typically, wouldn't it? You might have, depending on the country, you might go to a local politician if you trusted them, maybe. Um, maybe an independent politician, or you might have gone to the newspaper. But now, you know, uh, there aren't many newspapers that can really engage with this kind of thing over well or you go to an NGO that that you know fights oh, no. for your rights sure so. sure I, I'm saying yeah. I'm, I, I'm thinking they used to have if you're in that position there there used to be someone who you could go to but this problem then it's opaque to the newspapers it's not clear to the local politician either and they then maybe need to go to someone I, you know I, I was thinking about the the idea of the the perfect plaintiff you know, to make case law. I remember having this, this issue before. Um, and it, it engages with that question of, of when a person finds out that data about them is, is used to their disadvantage and tries to take action on it. As a weird example, a really weird example has popped up very recently. It's uh, Graham Doyle. Now, to give you the Irish perspective, <laughs> because it won't be clear, uh, about this case, which, uh, which is an ECJ case. This individual was convicted of murdering a very vulnerable woman in a particularly horrific way in a, in a lonely place in the Dublin mountains. The court case was, you know, main TV news for days and days and days. And I think it would be fair to say that he is, at, or was at that point, the most reviled person in Irish society. But the court still sided with them. That's the weird thing, you know, that, that actually um, when he found out that the police had used his data, this is a retention case, in a way that disadvantaged him and he argued um, was unlawful, the court vindicated his right. So uh, there are all sorts of plaintiffs with all sorts of cases. And it's the facts that matter. And it's, it's knowing and being able to prove technically what has actually happened. If I, I, I agree with everything you're saying, I'm just trying to think of how difficult it would be if we had potential complainants or plaintiffs approach us about something we knew nothing about and had no way of finding out about it, what would we do? Ideally, there'd be a network of NGOs working in each area and we'd, we'd pass them. But if the area is Irish social welfare benefits, and if that particular NGO you know, doesn't exist, we would have needed to have anticipated that case and started to figure out who we could send a, a quiet phone call to to be able to build the case. It, 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 it would have had to be ready to some extent before the plaintiff came to us. I think, I, I don't know, but if there was a way to, to do what you're describing, I would like to do it. I can't right now think of how I could do it though, myself. Before opening the floor for questions, um, I would just like to open this or come back to this question of um, redress, compensation. So how does this 
perspective of getting something uh, back, because you mentioned what does the data center get uh, from out of this, um, perhaps, how do you uh, frame this idea that perhaps they get uh, some money uh, out of it? Um, is it good news? I suppose it is good news. I've so You have to go now. So the, there's something that has never happened, and I've been waiting for it to happen. I, th uh, I can't remember the exact text. I think it's in Article 82, and it says, in a case of joint controllership, all controllers shall be liable for the entire thing, not the entire 26. damage. 26. Where, where is that? Article 26, I think. Okay, Jump wherever it is. <laughs> so we've got this incredible thing that says, if I happen to, even without knowing it, be in business with all of you people and you do something, we're all on the hook for what you've done. Now, that means that the biggest companies in the world, they're exposed to pay out very significant damage, but they are insured by a, a, a category of insurer that is so big it's not called an insurance company. It's called a reinsurance company because it insures the insurers. And I've been waiting for insurance premia to reflect this risk. I remember trying to get people in the insurance industry to write about it, think about it, talk about it. It's still, as far as I know, maybe you know better, it still hasn't happened. And when it does happen, then we'll see a change in behavior. And because when will it happen? Will it happen now with the new directive? Apparently, yeah, just um, huh? by accident, it just happened to meet in Vienna two months ago a reinsurer. Yeah. <laughs> Insuring against the risk of collective redress from ah, NGOs. Ah, uh, very good. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you get a commission happened to or be something? in Vienna for whatever. Yeah, of course, I get a commission, yeah. yeah. That's good. But <laughs> no, so apparently things are happening, yeah. Just, oh, great. Just they're prepared that something is coming, not only the fines from the DPA, but also the risk of collective redress. Uh, and, and we are preparing for collective redress for the directive, especially specifically. So we're just um, trying to be qualified in different member states, especially in we're not qualified in Belgium. We just created a foundation in the Netherlands uh, called Quick, uh, C U I C for C U in court, um, <laughs> which I think is a nice name. <laughs> and we are just exploring the other member state where we could be qualified as an NGO because the collective redress directive which will allow NGOs who, uh, which are already qualified in one member state to um, launch a cross-border litigation in another member state. And so what, what I, exactly, I think when I move, uh, the, oh. I broke this. Uh, want, you, want to share mine? No, no, it's okay. But I hope it's it's back. In. Um, so in concretely, what are your expectations? Are you now optimistic? Because I think that for the GDPR, it has been good. Voila, they, they, they will complement. And I, I just have a short story to, to maybe share uh, with this compliment, uh, complementary aspect of DPAs and, and court redress, I would say. We had a nice case, I think, with the Maltese uh, population. And it's on our website. If you're just interested, you can do, uh, go to the, Malt we call it the data breach in Malta case. Uh, the Daphne Foundation, named after this journalist who was murdered, uh, I think, five or six years ago in Malta, the Daphne Foundation found out that uh, apparently 95% of the Maltese population has been um, the, the, almost the entire population uh, has been um, uh, collected in a database with the political leaning, the political uh, opinion of these people uh, in a database, database that was breached on the internet. In such a country like Malta, when it's just a small country with everybody knowing each other, and of, especially if you cannot find a job mm. because you're not from the right political party, you can imagine the damage and the impact of these people that we can have. And here we had a nice, of a nice story because the Daphne Foundation approached us, NOIB, as a special organization doing litigation and especially enforcing the GDPR to protect people that are usually protected by this foundation. The, the, this, this kind of, they're really protecting democracy in Malta, right? We're trying to enforce the GDPR. And I think there was a nice marriage before a bit between a Maltese DPA protecting democracy and um, an NGO based in Vienna. Uh, sorry, NGO. not a DPA. <laughs> an NGO in Malta protecting democracy and an NGO based in Vienna enforcing the GDPR. So I think it was a nice success story. Um, so we helped them to file a complaint before the DPA. But surprisingly or not, the DPA did not identify the sources of the data. 
because you you understand that for us the most important thing was to know where the heck did you find this data? How is it possible that an IT company is collecting data about the entire population and the political leaning? So we kind of had a report from the DPA, and now we go to a class action in Malta using the report of the DPA mm -hmm. to complement the action that we had with the DPA. So I don't know if I just give you a nice example yes. of how you can complement. But are you going under the, the new directive or under the GDPR? No, there is already a class action avenue in Malta and the lawyers over there are just taking care of this. So in Malta, there was already a class action um, avenue already available. Whoa. <laughs> Nobody did it after. Anyway, time for your questions. You have a better microphone. Yes. Could, could I, I, ah, sorry, could I sorry. ask one question, maybe not, and that is, you know, this, I'm asking this of, of really Johnny and Wilma, what, what remedies are you seeking? Because I think that's another really interesting uh -huh. one about, you know, compensation and stuff, which is really difficult to, yeah, to get through, really, I would on say, distress. I would say, yeah. first of all, we, we oh, that's a tricky one. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. A, of course, as an, I would say, for us, we just want the GPR to be respected and complied with. Mm. So the cease and disease is already the first thing we would like to go for. Mm. Anyway, in the collective redress directive, you have two avenues. I just, you can ask for a cease and disease or, and or damages. Mm. Coming to the problem of funding, <laughs> <laughs> when you approach by funder, usually the funder would prefer damages mm. for obvious reasons. Because if you just have a cease and disease, it doesn't pay and the funder cannot have a commission on the seized and diseased. So that's another discussion, but we have our ways and the law, and usually in the Netherlands and the other countries as well, protects the independence of the NGO. So we are still, um, we are the one deciding on the case and the strategy and the funder cannot impose to, to us any obligation to settle or whatever. So usually we seek for a seized and diseased, but I would say the interest between the funder and an NGO and the other people affected can be aligned because when you see the level of fines by DPA sometimes, there is no way, in my opinion, that when you see the level of damages that we can claim and the, the claim that we are preparing in the Netherlands is like so huge that it, I think it just like go way beyond any fine that can be imposed by a DPA. Well, that's so of course, in my perspective, not because I want to, the, the funder to have a commission, would be really like a an, a private fine that on top of it would not be in the, um, the, the states or the government uh, uh, tax money or just um, CASA, but would just go directly to the data subject themselves. Because of course the, 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 the remaining money will also go, the remaining amount will also go to the data subject. So it's like a win-win situation when the data subject will be feeling involved because they will receive the money, they will have to understand what they are going to, why they are going to court. Plus, the damage can be substantially higher than any fine that has been issued by DPA. So I think for us it would be a win-win situation. Good. I think we, we can uh, take some questions. I, I saw one at the very end. The first one I saw. And while we're waiting, Judith, um, my answer is very brief. There's a, lot, there's a few different cases, but in general, stop processing. Mm -hmm. That's the main target general. Hello. Oh, yes. Hello. Thank you so much for um, for the panel. Um, <clears throat> so I'm working on um, setting up an NGO that does strategic litigation on these questions, and I was really curious to know a point that you raised, uh, Mr. Ryan, around struggling to figure out what is actually going on on behind the curtain. It strikes me um, when you say this, because actually DPAs have really strong investigation powers. It really struck me actually with Schrems too, with uh, the, you know, the European court actually staring at DPAs and saying, you are not using your investigation powers enough. So I was um, kind of maybe more turning to you, uh, Mr. Robert, to actually know, based on your experience, have you actually tried to turn to DPAs and say, we would like you to investigate and draw your own conclusions. Um, do you have anyone uh, experiences to share around this? Thanks. <laughs> I, see Johnny, I see Johnny laughing because you know the answer. <laughs> yeah, we tried to ask the DPC to investigate, for example. They did not. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not fair. We try, we, we ask them to investigate more, but they say, no, I want to investigate this. And it's not only the DPC. We ask the Maltese DPA to investigate that, and they just investigate that. 
So and and usually DP is like, I'm sorry, you're you're just a complainant. We decide whether we want to investigate first of all. So sometimes they don't even investigate at all because they say well, we don't want to investigate, and they determine the scope of the investigation. Uh, and of course, it's not, nothing against DPC here. It's just because, of course, the DPC usually is the lead DPA. And you heard it this morning that the lead DPA is defining the scope of the investigation. And usually, the other DPAs have no say uh, about the scope of the investigation. And the complainant sometimes doesn't have, any, doesn't have anything to say either. So it's very complicated for us sometimes. In other cases, we ask to investigate. And for example, under, and that's another example of difference of national procedural law. In Austria, you can make a claim. I don't even remember the German name. But you can make a claim, and that's your right under Austrian administrative law to request the authority to make an investigation. And in my understanding, the authority has to do it or has to explain why the authority refused to do it. So it's also depending on national procedural law and, of course, resources. And another example, sometimes some DPAs consider as investigation the observations or the submission that they receive from the other party, mm -hmm. which I think is a little bit laughable. Do because <laughs> Let me also answer a little bit. Um, several times it's been necessary to equip the data protection authorities with technical evidence and material because in several cases they haven't either been interested or capable of getting this for themselves and when presented with it, in some cases, have not been able to understand it or act upon it. So uh, it would be great if we could rely on their incredible powers, uh, legal powers of investigation. But you know, there aren't many examples of those powers actually being practically used, uh, especially for highly technical, well, supposedly highly technical cases. I don't know if it's to, to disturb you. Uh, I just wanted to add, as a moderator, uh, just uh, some background information. There is a, also a pending case precisely on this question of the nature of what is, uh, when you lodge a complaint, what's the nature of the decision that the DPA has to take? Uh, do they really have to uh, take a, a decision guided very much on what you have been asking for? Um, so that's in, in, in Luxembourg. And there are also, for instance, cases in, in, in France, uh, people going to court uh, saying, well, the CNIL did not investigate uh, as, uh, in the way they should have been investigating. And I think then the Conseil d'État is only just checking if there's a, a manifest mistake, uh, a manifest error in, in the judgment, then they might actually intervene. But otherwise, as long as there's no manifest mistake, uh, that's the CNIL decided, and they have this uh, freedom margin of, of a precision to, to decide. So it really depends uh, nationally on, 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 the, on the cases. And we have this big open question in Luxembourg, too. If, if I can add a little bit. So there was a report following Max Schrems' efforts back 10 years ago. There was a report, or two reports, from the Irish DPC, from audits they did um, in 2011 and 2012. So that's really old. Uh, but those reports are extremely interesting about Facebook. And they are also very helpful in understanding the architecture of those systems and also as a data subject to know exactly what kind of data is most relevant to you, going back to this idea of access requests. So I've done this for, for myself to get access to data under maybe surprisingly safe harbor. And that actually obtained some data for myself and it changed the systems of, uh, of Facebook, this, this action in front of arbitration court. Um, it also was used by uh, um, a U.S. senator to put Mark Zuckerberg in front of contradictions compared to the evidence I collected by interacting with Facebook's legal team. Um, so, and the result was that further transparency requirements or further transparency tools were implemented by Facebook. So all this together is really about each actor using their transparency powers to more effectively document what is going on. The, the authority to do an audit, the individual to request data. And I think there is quite a lot of possibilities there. Um, in the US, there have been a lot of clauses around arbitration, um, forced arbitration for, for individuals interacting with companies. And that has been exploited by um, Uber drivers who said, OK, you want us to go through arbitration if we have something to litigate with you? Then we will do it, but en masse. So you have to appoint a judge for every single one of us who is going through arbitration with Uber. And that is 
part of some of the opportunities that are there, um, especially in relation to the follow-up to Privacy Shield, there will be arbitration mechanisms for European citizens in front of American companies. So this whole thing can be tangled together for much more, much faster collective action around transparency. We'll take uh, a couple of questions. Um, yes, I see more than a couple. I see three now. And it, it is one, two, three. Yes, you were one. And then two, three. And uh, Rene, Rene, I don't know you're for. Uh, hi, um, my name is Aurelie Pauls. I, I had a, a simple, I think, yes and no question uh, because we're talking about judicial remedies and um, I'm seeing um, law firms being backed by VCs for certain things as well. Michigan Reyes, for example, in the UK. Um, could we imagine collaboration between civil society and these kinds of initiatives or is that not imaginable at all? Thank you. We'll really take many questions to keep them in mind and you'll try to find a question that you like. Uh, there was another one there. And just... uh, David Erdos from uh, Cambridge University. I, I just wanted to come back on this issue of um, class actions. Um, I mean, it seems that the EU has always um, resisted sort of US, uh, US style class actions and you know, there's, there's still issues around what comparable harm might mean. And you've mentioned that some member states actually provide for this anyway. I, I mean, to what extent, therefore, do you think the collective redress directive, which is maybe I've got this wrong, but as I understand it, doesn't go and mandate class actions for compensation. It, it stops short of that. To what extent do you think this is going to be a game changer in data protection? Wait, wait. Thank you. And the... Almost last, because Rene is looking at me like this. The almost last question. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting. Um, I, um, I brought up a question in the morning in one of the panels that was a representative of the Apple. Um, it's a private sector company. And I ask if it is uh, the case or how they see uh, the institu institutionalization of procedures, uh, internal procedures directly addressed by the people uh, to them, uh, legal procedures. We see, uh, of course, they, they, they don't have to act as legal authority, but we see now that they are pretty much doing that already, but without procedures. Um, she answered that these procedures exist, we can go directly to the Apple website, and yeah, that's the case, but I think that they are still most of the of the big tech companies uh, are dealing with this kind of uh, inquiries from the people as a customer service complaint. And they say, we, um, at the end, I don't know if you have had this experience, but at the end they say, do you agree with our answer? Okay, we, we have five minutes, we have, five, it, we have very quick. Just, just like that, just um, from the AEO or the litigation perspective, uh, how do you um, see this, uh, that, Judicial remedies are good, but how about the standards for internal uh, remedies in the private uh, big tech company? Thank you very much. Rene, can you be very, very quick? Rene, can you be... I put you on the spot. Uh, it's okay. Okay. So we have five minutes, uh, like a general uh, answer, statement, and everything you put. Judith, your smile. Right. Um, I think I wanted to uh, say something with regard to the second question, which is um, I, I find this a very interesting question about the remedies because there are, um, I think that, that, you know, talk about the money is always a little bit iffy when it comes to this, talking about the funders, how are we going to get these cases to court? Um, and I think one of the things that I wanted to raise, and I, I made that point earlier, is that there is, on the one hand, on the one hand there is a, is a problem because it has traditionally been very, very difficult to actually um, prove damage under the European system. And I think I agree with you, David, in that respect that, you know, that might be some of the reservation that we have because really under the, under the system of how we calculate damage, we cannot have an American style class action system because that very much relies on punitive damages, on the ability to make really big splashes, you know, to have a deterrent effect. And we don't have that. But on the other hand, and, and this is something I read very recently, which really hadn't occurred to me, 
Um, in Germany, we have this wonderful, uh, you know, saying of Klein Vieh macht auch Mist, which is like, you know, a lot of small actions together can come to a really, really big fine. And I think one of the possibilities that we have with class action is that if we get enough claimants together, almost like, you know, Volkswagen diesel claim style, there can still be an awful lot of money on, at stake which can, as, as Omar said before, really you know, go far beyond any fine that a DPA is willing to impose. And I think that is definitely something where we could look at how we can use the compensation claim in this context as a deterrent. You know, ultimately, the money that everybody gets is not going to be a lot. But... Yes, to answer quickly the question, I think the game changer, I, I think so, because the, currently the collective actions are only possible in the in some member states, I would not say a few, but a lot actually, but not all of them. And the Collective Redress Directive, which is trying to harmonize some elements, and I will not list all of them, but first of all, there will be an obligation for all member states to have a class action avenue, that's for sure. Along the lines explained by the directive, which is a little bit vague, I would say, but at least we will have like a common understanding of what is a collective redress. Second, uh, there would be an opportunity, and this is not existing nowadays. Today, you can't, if you are an Austrian NGO, go in another member state to have um, to start a class action. And this directive would just finally make it possible, uh, which I think is a good thing as well, because we cannot speak about member state by member state uh, class action. It doesn't make sense to me, especially if you're an EU organization, you want to address one problem before one judge, preferably for the entire population of the EU. You don't want to have seven, uh, 27 similar litigation against each controller in each jurisdiction. Uh, and lately, um, <clears throat> um, it will not have American style class action for sure, because the collective redress directive also addresses this problem and makes clear that only non-profit organization can start litigation. So the, 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 the law firm action will not be possible in the EU for sure. Uh, one minute, please. Well, I think I don't have any answer, but I think the question about VC funding of civil society efforts is a really important one, and I hope this panel can give a, an answer to it today. On that question, um, I was approached uh, by a litigation funder, and it wasn't right. The, the, the conditions weren't the right conditions. Um, that's not recent, that's a while back. Um, I wouldn't rule anything out, but only if the conditions were right. And I'd say the likelihood that the conditions would be right is slim. Um, so without ruling anything out, the answer is probably no. <laughs> um, on the second question about collective redress, I, what's really interesting is that uh, it engages a wider set of what it calls consumer harms, David. Um, it's not just data protection. Maybe it's things that come from data protection that aren't data protection. That's exciting. What's less exciting is that uh, we find ourselves in a conversation at the moment with Irish legislators <laughs> because although they will implement the directive, they will not currently, it seems, be making other changes to Irish law that would actually make the directive meaningful in Irish law. There's a few snags in the, in the trunk of the car. We're trying to get them to fix that. Uh, I didn't quite grasp the third question, I'm very sorry to say. Um, but, but in as much as I understood it, I didn't like its, its, its idea that there might be in the private sector some sort of quasi-judicial process. I have no rational reason for that. It's just a kind of a, um, a reactive thing. Um, in an ideal world, we'd have proper enforcement by proper enforcers, and we wouldn't have to even engage with thoughts such as those, because the private sector would be terrified of the enforcer doing its job. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are really at the end of this. I have two important messages. I think I was supposed to do like a summary, a meaningful summary of everything this I want to do. <laughs> But uh, for me, I think an important message uh, from this panel is that we were somehow asked, we were invited not to discuss too much data protection authorities because we are discussing data protection authorities and criticizing data protection authorities all the time. So this panel was not supposed to do, do be about that. But I think it's, it's very difficult, of course, to think about enforcement of the GDPR 
and forget about the, 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 the DPAs mm. or the, the, the problems with the DPAs. So I think that it's probably to be uh, underlined. Another important message, there is no coffee break. I was told, tell, tell them there is no coffee break, people. There is no coffee break. And the other message is that you have to go, but before you go, please uh, thank our speakers for their wonderful contributions. Thank you. Thank you.